Hi everyone, this is a tune called Abide With Me. Good morning and welcome to worship at Lino Lakes Community Church. We are glad you're here. Hi everyone, this is a tune from the MH, number 156, I Love to Tell the Story. Thank you. 
What really grinds your gears? You know, what cooks your beans? What really shucks your corn? What burns your toast? You know what I mean? I've been asking people all week, you know, what are the top three things that people do in public that just peel your potatoes? I got a lot of interesting responses. You know, I just spent a week with my family, uh, so I have a bunch of ideas. Uh, but here are some responses that I got. When people take up the whole walking area, not considering the others around them. When people play their music too loud in a public area, especially on cell phones. When people drive too close to your car. When people feel empowered to comment on your appearance, good or bad. When people turn without signaling or cut across multiple lanes to exit. When people try to make small talk while waiting in lines. Being in a room when people are arguing, when people make out, and that was Amy's. When people remove their masks to sneeze. This one happened while I was writing this sermon in the airport. And depending on the mood, people's mere existence can be annoying. How about you all? What do people do that really steams your carrots? I'm interested to know. Well, this morning, we're going to talk about grace and forgiveness. But first, I want us to hold this resentment that we feel towards people uh, that annoy us, because that's where we live. You know, we live out in the roads and in the grocery stores and the homes where people do stuff that annoys the heck out of us. And how do we respond? How should we respond? Does God's grace and forgiveness extend even to these moments? How is God speaking to us when we're frustrated in traffic, when we're in the grocery store, when we're waiting outside a bathroom stall? How does God speak to us when we're out in the roads? Our scripture lesson this morning is from Luke 15, verses 1 through 3, and verses 11 through 32. All the tax collectors and sinners were gathering around Jesus to listen to him. The Pharisees and legal experts were grumbling, saying, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them? Jesus told them this parable. Jesus said, A certain man had two sons. The younger son and his, and his father. The younger son said to his father, Father, give me my share of the inheritance. Then the father divided his estate among them. Soon afterwards, the younger son gathered everything together and took a trip to a land far away. There he wasted his wealth through extravagant living. When he had used up his resources, a severe food shortage arose in that country and he began to be in need. He hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. He longed to eat his fill from what the pigs ate, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have more than enough food, but I am starving to death. I will get up and I will go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer deserved to be called your son. Take me as one of your hired hands. So he got up and went to his father. While he was still a long way off, the father saw him and was moved with compassion. His father ran to him and hugged him and kissed him. Then his son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Fetch the fattened calf calf and slaughter it. We must celebrate with feasting because this son of mine was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. Coming in from the field, he approached the house and heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked, what, what's going on? The servant replied, Your brother has arrived, and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he received his son back safe and sound. Then the older son was furious and didn't want to enter in. 
But his father came out and begged him. He answered his father, Look, I served you all these years, and I never disobeyed your instructions. Yet you've never given me so much as a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours returned after gobbling up your estate on prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. Then his father said, Son, you are always with me. Everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. For scripture in, among, and beyond us, thanks be to God. Now I know I always talk about how I love this verse of scripture and how this is one of my favorite stories. Well, this one is actually my favorite story in scripture. We have such an interesting setting with such interesting characters, and the first three verses of Luke 15 lay out where Jesus is and what he's doing. He's eating, and he's eating with sinners and tax collectors, and off to the side you have the Pharisees and the legal experts. And you know, they made sure, the Pharisees and the legal experts, they made sure that they're far enough away so people don't think they're eating with sinners and tax collectors, but they're still close enough that they could hear Jesus' message to the sinners and tax collectors. And they're grumbling about it. You know, one of the things they hate to see in public is when supposed messiahs eat with sinners. And so they're all eating and Jesus starts telling stories, as people often do at dinner parties. And Jesus tells the story of things that are lost but then are found. You know, the lost sheep when the shepherd leaves the 99 to find the one because a really good shepherd knows when one sheep needs help and will meet that sheep where they're at. Then he calls all his friends and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. And then he talks about the woman who loses one of her ten silver coins. She cleans the whole house and then finally, finally finds it. It's a long search, but she finds her precious item. Then she calls her friends together and says, Rejoice with me! I found my lost coin. Then we arrive at my favorite story, the tale of two brothers and a father. And those are the characters of this story, the father, the older son, and the younger son, and we, the audience, get to bear witness to how they interact with each other. The story begins with a twist. The younger son wants his inheritance. Now, I'm not sure exactly how wills worked back in the day, but usually it was the oldest son who would inherit the estate, and then his siblings would continue to work and live with that new head of household. And if something happened to the older son, the next oldest would take their place, and so on and so forth. That feels like how a lot of things still work today, for better or worse. And so the twist is that the younger son asks for half of the inheritance of his older brother's future stuff. Wild. This is unheard of. Well, maybe not. Israel has a history and a habit of the inheritance going to the wrong son. Just read through Genesis, you'll know. But you could imagine how anger and resentment would begin to fester in the relationship between these brothers. Then we have a second twist. The father complies. The younger son basically told his dad, I wish you were dead, give me half of my brother's inheritance. And the father just does it. The f in the first verse of Jesus telling the story, we already have two twists. Now I'm sure most of you have heard this story many times and know how it goes. The prodigal son goes on a trip, squanders his wealth and frivolous living, and ends up working in the worst possible environment for a Jewish person to work, a pig farm. And he longs to eat what they eat. And then there's this moment. In the Greek it says, Aisautan althon. It basically says, having gone into himself. Althon is a variation on the word erkamai, which is the verb that means to come or to go. The word for coming and going, for traveling. So he went on an inward journey and confronted himself. He came to his senses. He had a realization. He knew something deep and intrinsic about himself that he had never known before. Aisauton 
Althorn. And then he begins the journey of repentance. He starts walking home. And on the way, he's playing the conversation over and over in his head. Have you ever had to apologize to someone and rehearse the conversation in your head over and over and over and over and over and over again? That's what he's doing. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. And you can picture him rehearsing this again and again as he walks down this long road that he grew up on, past all the houses and past all the people that he walked by on his way out of town. Who knows what he said or did as he left in the naivety of youth. And as he's on this road, his father sees him. The father is moved with compassion and he runs out. The younger son is still a long way off, but the father rushes to meet him. And the younger son begins that rehearsed apology. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against... But the father does not care. You can picture the servants running after the father, trying to keep up with him as he rushed out the door. Grab the finest coat. Grab the signet ring that signifies someone of high standing in my family. Get ready for a feast. It is time to celebrate. My son who was lost has been found. My son has come back to life. The part of this story that gets me the most is that even before the younger son can say his apology, he is restored. The father's love and grace precedes the younger son's repentance. Another twist. Jesus' audience expects the younger son to be met with punishment that fits his crimes or to be excommunicated back to where he came from. And so we have a happy ending. Well, for the younger son. And it's at this moment that the older son returns from the field. I like to imagine he meets one of the servants on the same road where his younger brother was just welcomed and restored. And the older son asks, what's going on? He learns of the feast. He learns of the, his brother's return. And he refuses to participate in the joy of welcoming him home. He doesn't want to rejoice because the lost thing was found. The resentment that materialized at the beginning of the story has finally boiled over into judgment. Jesus introduces another twist. The father again goes out to the road, this time to plead with his oldest son. You know, the audience expects the typical, typical patriarchal response of fall in line, you live under my roof, you play by my rules. But instead the father begs. Please, rejoice, come celebrate. Your brother was lost and is now found. And now it's time for the older son's top three reasons why he hates his younger brother. He doesn't work as hard as me. He doesn't obey you. He wastes all your money. And then you give him this huge feast when I don't get anything? Our list of grievances can get pretty long when resentment sits in our hearts and in our spirits. And then our story ends with another invitation from a father to his son in the middle of the road. You already have everything. But your brother was dead and now he is alive. He was lost. He was Now he's found. So we must celebrate. Won't you come to the party? Then the story ends. Won't you come to the party? You can picture the people at the table around Jesus leaning in to hear the story. Can, you can imagine them looking at each other as Jesus ends the parable going, Is that it? What happens next? Did the two brothers reconcile their relationship? And I can imagine Jesus' smug look as he invites them to think about what the parable means. Because that's the purpose of a parable, to make you think, or maybe Jesus took that moment to invite the Pharisees over to his table to eat with him and the sinners. I love this story because it illustrates the depth of God's forgiveness and grace towards us. 
And it also leaves us an open invitation to participate in the story. We are also invited to rejoice. We're invited to the party. We're invited to feast. And it's pretty easy. We can trace the lines from the parable characters to the people present at Jesus' table. You know, the Pharisees are the uptight, resentful older brother. The sinners and tax collectors are the lost younger brother just coming into their senses. Ice out on a phone, the inward journey. And Jesus is bringing them into connection with the grace of God that cannot be bought or earned, only experienced. That same grace is available for everyone. And this story happens again and again over time. You know, we have all participated in this story. Maybe as all these different characters, we have rebelled, we have held resentment, we've cast judgment, we've refused to eat with someone, we've forgiven someone, we've offered grace. Or maybe we've been met by that grace in the middle of the road. I spent the last week with my own siblings and my dad in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. My dad booked this trip two years ago for the family, but it was delayed twice because of COVID. And I recognize you experience a lot of annoying things when you're traveling, and especially when you're a tourist surrounded by other tourists. And one of the evenings we were on a boardwalk, you know, that has a ton of restaurants and shops, and we've just been walking all day and we're getting a little snippy with each other. You know what I mean, I'm sure you've been there. And so we found a taxi that could seat 10 people and the driver seemed a little off put. I could understand why, you know, he was a shorter, older Mexican guy. He'd been working for 15 hours and driving in Mexico is terrifying. He was probably tired and we were just a bunch of cranky tourists. So the 10 of us pile into this van and off we go. And the driver asks my dad where he's from and my dad responds, Minnesota. And the driver asks, where in Minnesota? The Twin Cities. And he's asked, where in the Twin Cities? Oh, this is kind of weird. Why does this guy care? Like, what does he know about Minnesota? Why is he asking what city we live in? So my dad says, Coon Rapids. And he says, oh, Invergrove Heights. I used to live in Invergrove Heights before I moved to Massachusetts. No way. So we started talking about Minnesota. He said he used to be a professional musician. He met his wife in Minneapolis. He had kids in the U.S. And then he went into the story of how he had gotten addicted to a way of life. He was addicted to, to drugs and to alcohol, and he became addicted to that bad way of living when he was in Minnesota. And it was during that time that he experienced one of those moments he he came to himself, Ais Autan Elthon. He went on an inward journey and he recognized that he needed to change. And so he and his family moved to another state and they got a fresh start. And as he told this story, I was thinking about this text, Luke 15. And here's a man who has experienced and embodies the type of transformation Jesus is preaching about. The taxi driver said he thanked God for that moment that he came to himself, that it was in that moment that God changed his life forever. What a testimony. And so we asked him what brought him to the U.S. And he said it began when he was a kid. He was born in Mexico, and at the age of nine, he was abandoned, and he began living on trains. And for three years, he lived hopping from one train to another, to another, to another, until he was 12. And then that's when he ended up getting in a fight with some other folks who were living on the trains. And he was thrown out of a moving train. He didn't know where he was. He didn't have anything. And he said he walked for three days without food and very little water, trying to get somebody to pick him up, to take him anywhere. And he said finally this car passed him, stopped, and then backed up and picked him up. And it was two hippies that were on vacation. They got him some food. They went to a hotel. They told him to go take a shower. And after that, they went to a clothing store and they bought him some new outfits that he could wear. And he traveled with them 
during their stay in Mexico. And as they approached the border, they asked him if he liked them and if he wanted to come and live with them. He said yes. And so they hid him in their trunk and that's how he got to the U.S. to live in California with Mary and Julian. And so those two hippies saved his life because all he could think about on that road for three days was getting revenge on the people who abandoned him. He lived with Mary and Julian until he was 17. He learned to play guitar. He moved to Minnesota. He met his wife. He had kids. They moved to Massachusetts after that journey. And eventually, they took in Julian as he aged and needed help. What a testimony. What an amazing journey that comes full circle in so many ways. And so we asked what brought him back to Mexico. Nine years ago, when his wife passed, he began to feel depressed and anxious. He didn't know what to do, so he decided to come back to Mexico. And he began driving taxis, and he said talking to passengers has been his therapy. On the days he doesn't work, he goes and he teaches children how to play music. He works with some folks in Canada who help him buy instruments. And every six months, some of someone from his family comes down and visits him. He likes to tell passengers the story of his life in hopes that it will open their eyes to the ways God is present in the world. Ais Autan Althon. An invitation in word. That's what he's doing. He's offering this invitation on a journey. And when we tried to tip him, he refused and said, give it to someone in need that we see on our trip. What a testimony. I was stunned as I sat in this van careening down cobblestone roads. And as I sat with the text for this week, I thought about how all of this stuff happens on roads and how this man's life has changed again and again as he wandered down roads. And now he's inviting other people to change as he drives them down similar roads, hoping to open their eyes, hoping that they might help the poor. What roads do we live in? Who are we running into? Who are we embodying? Are we the older brother holding resentment, passing judgment? Are we the younger brother asking for inheritance, breaking relationships? Are we coming back with humility? Are we experiencing repentance? Ice Alton Althon. Is the father there? What's the father saying to us? What's he saying to you? I said my Lenten theme this year was exploring the ways God is speaking to us. How is God speaking to you in the middle of the road? Where are we experiencing God's grace and where can we offer it to others? Where and how are we telling the story of God's grace so that our stories may become an invitation to the party like Jesus' parable was to us, like that taxi driver's testimony is to all his passengers. Because God's grace is good. And it's time to rejoice, because the thing that was lost has been found. Amen. Hi everyone, this is a tune from UMH, number 593, Here I Am, Lord.
you for joining us for worship today. God sends you the spirit fill you. Christ go with you and you with Christ always and everywhere. Go in peace.